Hey guys, uh, one of my favorite stories actually happened at the college I went to, but before I was there. It, it happened on the soccer team, which I also played for, but it was before I was there. And it had to do with, with the goalie, actually, the goalkeeper. Uh, the, the, the school that I went to long before I was there, they were playing in the conference championship game. And they were up 1-0 going into the last bit of the game. And there was a shot that was taken. And the goalie the goalie dove and it went under the goalie. And he assumed it went in. He, he got up from, from his dive, went walked behind him to, to what he thought was to pick the ball out of the back of the net. And lo and behold, the ball was, was behind the net. And he's like, oh my gosh, it must have gone wide. I must have not known where the post was. And so... He goes, gets the ball. The other team was arguing with the the referee for a bit, and uh, to no avail. And he put the ball down. That you know they checked for holes, didn't find any holes in the net, and so uh, he, they they played on. And uh, the school I went to ended up winning the the conference championship. And after the game, the goalie went back to the goal, and there was a guy that was sitting behind the goal, and, and he went to the guy and said, "Hey, you know, by any chance, do you remember that ball that uh, that I missed?" Did that go in? And the guy said, "Oh yeah, that 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 definitely went it went in. It must have been uh, a hole in the net." And so the goalie went back to the goal, and at first glance, at the bottom in the side netting, it didn't look like there was a, a, a hole in the net. But if 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 you uh, as he investigated a little bit further, there there was indeed a hole in the net. And so the goalie went to his coach, and he, he they actually went to the referee. And they said, listen, um, there is a hole in the net. And since we're the home team, we're responsible for providing adequate playing uh, playing conditions, adequate nets, adequate field. You know, we're the ones responsible for this. Um, we, we don't feel good winning this way. And the ref said, you know what, there's nothing we can do. And as, as the, the next day happened, it just did not sit right with the school, the school I went to, these players and these coaches. And they said, you know, we really just don't want to win this way. And so they called the the officials, the lead, the the like the head of the the referees of the conference, and they said, hey, this just is not sitting well with us. We don't want to win this way. And they actually ended up replaying the conference championship game, all because of what this one goalie said after they had already had won it. Here's what I'm getting at. I I don't know what I would have done in that situation. Right? I'm not sure if any any of us can can definitively say what we would have done if we were that goalie. Would we have played on? Would we have talked to the ref? I don't know. But but here's what I'm getting at. Knowing what to do in the moment isn't always that simple. And and that's what we're talking about in this new series, this new topic, this new conversation that we're having about what to do when we don't know what to do. Today, we're going to look at this idea of what to do when we don't know what's right and what's wrong. What, what to do when, 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 when there's there's tension between what, what's right and what's easy or what's right and what's wrong. And it, it'd be easy if doing the right thing was always clear and obvious, right? But But we all know that isn't the case. Sometimes the right thing isn't the obvious thing. You know, if you're dating somebody, but maybe you're texting somebody else, like, a lot. And you're like, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not cheating on anybody. We're just texting it at 2 a.m. That's that's not wrong, right? Or, or is it? Maybe you have a teammate on one of your teams who's talking about how the coach hates them and the coach just, just doesn't like them and the coach is being a jerk and benches them for no reason and but but you know the truth is that your teammate actually has things that they need to work on, and it's probably fair that they're not getting as much playing time as they'd like. Is it wrong to, to tell them the truth? It would hurt their feelings, but is it wrong to not tell them the truth if if fixing that one thing might get them more playing time? Maybe you have a friend who's doing something that, that really bothers you. They just they have a they have a quality or they have a they have a habit that just drives you crazy and you don't know if you should talk to them about it or not and and you might be thinking if I confront them about this am I just going to look like a jerk or is, is this my issue or is it their issue should I just get over this or is it worth bringing up right sometimes the right thing to do isn't obvious now sometimes the right thing costs us something you know it it costs this soccer team something to to do the right thing they had to replay the game now they actually ended up winning the replayed game, but it, it cost them something 
to do the right thing. It cost them something to bring this up to the refs. It cost them something to, to call the, the director of the officials. It cost them a championship. They, they had to replay the game. You know, you, you might know the right thing to do right now or in a, situa- in a situation in your life is to be honest with your parents about something. But you know that if you're honest with them about something, there might be a consequence. You might lose your phone. You might lose a privilege, right? Doing the right thing might cost you something. You know, you might know that the right thing to do is not is to, to not be in a relationship anymore. Maybe it's a dating relationship. Maybe it's just a friendship. But you know that if you end the dating relationship or you know if you end the friendship, you, you might feel alone. You, you, you might know the right thing to do is to not let somebody cheat off of you on a test. But, but you know that the person might, might make fun of you or judge you or not like you anymore if you say no. So you feel like doing the right thing might, might cost you something socially. You see what I mean? Sometimes what's right might feel complicated. Sometimes what's right isn't always cut and dry. It's not always easy. And even when we do uh, what's right, we, even if we know what's right, sometimes it's, it's difficult to actually do it. And so with that in mind, we're going to pick back up in the life of, of Joseph. Uh, we started talking about Joseph last week. Joseph is a prominent figure in the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament. Um, there's a musical written about him, Joseph in the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Some of us have heard about Joseph. And so last week, Jess uh, talked to us a little bit about the beginning part of Joseph Joseph's life. So just to review, Joseph had some dreams from God about his brothers. Now, they were kind of interesting dreams that had to do with his brothers bowing down to him. Now, Joseph uh, made a pretty courageous decision and decided to share that dream with his brothers. And his brothers were under, understandably upset about it. And so they... Uh, actually weren't that upset about it. They were infuriated to the point where they actually sold Joseph into slavery. They were actually going to kill him. And one of their other brothers uh, convinced the other, the rest of the brothers, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him. Is that better? I don't even know if that's better. But they sold him into slavery and Joseph was taken into the, the country of Egypt. And his father thinks he's dead. And that's kind of where we left, left, left off last week. But we left off with this, with this idea that, that God was with Joseph. God was with Joseph. Even, even in the midst of a really hard thing. Even in the midst of being betrayed by his family. Even in the midst of being sold by his brothers to go live in a foreign country. God was with Joseph. Now, when Joseph got to Egypt, he ended up living in the house of of this guy named Potiphar. And uh, Potiphar was this um, this prominent official in Pharaoh's court. He was a, kind of this government guy. And, and, and Joseph actually got to, to work um, with Potiphar. And so here's what it says in Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 through 6. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Potiphar really trusted trusted Joseph, and rightfully so, right? Joseph, Potiphar's house prospered under Joseph. The only thing Potiphar had to worry about with Joseph in charge of his household was the food he ate, right? He had no worries, hakuna matata, right? No cares in the world. Potiphar trusted Joseph. And, and, and right, right, he should have. His life was thriving. Here's what it says next. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. So there's two things here, right? Joseph, handsome guy. Well-built, uh, handsome guy. 
pleasing to look at. But Potiphar's wife was interested in Joseph and invited him to the bedroom. Now here's where things get complicated, right? Joseph was a servant. He was not only required to obey Potiphar, he was also required to obey Potiphar's wife. So if he refused her commands, if he there was nothing holding her back from, from punishing him. He could be kicked out of the household. He could get arrested. He could even be killed. But if he did what she asked, that would create a whole other set of problems. Right? She was married to his boss. So both options, saying yes or saying no, came with different issues. It wasn't easy or clear. It wasn't cut and dry to Joseph what he should do. So what did Joseph do when he didn't know what to do? Here's what happens next. Joseph refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not, does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, day after day, this happened more than once. This was an ongoing thing. But, but what this tells us is out of respect for Potiphar, and even more importantly, out of his desire to honor God, Joseph did the next right thing. Joseph didn't make a decision based on how things might turn out for him, like losing his job, being arrested, or even losing his life. He made a decision based on what was right. And what was right in that moment was turning down Potiphar's wife. It was difficult. It was complicated. But it was the right thing to do. It wasn't exactly like his life was perfect as a result of making the right choice. In fact, things got worse. Potiphar's wife was was mad at Joseph for turning her down, so she falsely accuses Joseph of rape. Now, now Potiphar believes his wife and has Joseph thrown in prison. Not exactly the happy ending you're hoping for, maybe expecting somebody that does the right thing to to do, but Joseph, Joseph didn't make his decision based on what it might mean for him. He did what was right, and he did what was right with God, and he trusted God with the outcome. Now, obviously, the outcome wasn't great, but there's a word that that I want us to know that changes everything when it comes to the doing the right thing kind of moment, and that that word is integrity. You've probably heard it before, but integrity means being the kind of person who does what's right regardless of the outcome and regardless of who's around. Sometimes doing the right thing will get you an applause. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes doing the right thing will cost you something. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes doing the right thing will make you look good. But sometimes doing the right thing will make you look stupid. We don't get to decide how things turn out. But we do get to decide what kind of person we want to be. And being a person of integrity will lead us to to lead a life with less regret, more respect, more honor for God, and a better idea of what to do in every situation. Now, the chances are we're not going to find ourselves in this exact same situation that Joseph was in, but we will find ourselves in in all kinds of situations where we have to decide what to do without knowing how things are going to turn out. It could go better than we thought. It could go worse than we thought. But when we make our decisions with integrity based on what's right, we're living lives we can be proud of. And more specifically, we're living lives that we know are honoring God. So here's one thing we want us to remember this week. When you don't know what to do, do the next right thing. Focus on what's right in front of you. When you don't know what to do, do the next right thing. So I want to encourage us to do this this week. Think of one situation where you know the right thing to do, but you're afraid to do it. What are you afraid of? What would you do if fear was not a factor in your mind? And I want to encourage us this week, determine the types of people that we want to be. 
I'm not talking about five years from now. I want to talk, I'm talking about what type of person do you want to be today? What type of person do you want to be this week? What do you need to do today? What do you need to do tomorrow that will set you up to be the kind of person who, who respects yourself, can be proud of your decisions, and, and can, can have a clear conscience knowing that you've made decisions that are, that are respecting other people and more importantly, honoring God? Here's the deal. I think a lot of us know the right thing to do in most situations, but fear keeps us from acting how we know we should act. And, and fear and inaction keep us from the people that we want to be, not down the line, but right now. So he, he, that's what I'm encouraging us to do this week. Think of something that you know the right thing to do, even if you're afraid to do it. Determine the kind of person you want to be today. Tell somebody the next right thing you're going to do. A trusted friend, a mentor, maybe your small group leader, maybe somebody in your small group, somebody you trust. Invite them to pray for you and then and then invite them to check up on you. You know, accountability can be really powerful in, in our relationships and in our kind of faith journey as our faith is growing throughout our lives. Accountability, people checking in on us, holding us accountable for the things that we said we're going to do, that can be really, really powerful. So. Find somebody to share this with. Encourage them. Invite them to pray for you. Invite them to ask you about this a week later. Check up and see if you actually did it. Because when we walk through life with people, it helps us live with integrity. So find someone in your small group. Share with them. As you guys talk to your groups this week and go throughout your week, I want to encourage us, when you don't know what to do, do the next right thing.